I uh, received some advice to use this time to talk about highlights you know, of my life uh, for the last 30 years, share some of my favorite memories since it's my birthday. <laughs> Lucky for you all, I don't always listen to Jerry, but uh... <laughs> every year since 1953, the fourth Thursday in November has been known by some not as Thanksgiving, but as the National Day of Mourning. Organized by the United American Indians of New England, hundreds and in recent years, thousands of indigenous people and their allies gather in Plymouth, Massachusetts to remember the mass killing of native people, seizing of their lands, and the erasure of native cultures. The website for the event says, we too would enjoy being home, eating turkey, watching football. We have nothing against the Harvest Festival, but we cannot silently watch as the pilgrim mythology is celebrated. A little context, probably reminders uh, for most of us, uh, as we learned in school. In November 1620, the Mayflower arrived in North America. It had been pushed off course by storms and ended up landing not uh, where they had planned, where they had permission to settle, uh, but in Provincetown. They drafted a document called the Mayflower Compact, which laid down rules for the pilgrims, as they later came to be called, to follow before going to shore. The Mayflower Compact is said to be one of the foundations of American democracy. Upon coming off the ship, they settled in Plymouth Bay, which had been formerly inhabited by the Wampanoag tribe. As the lesson goes, the pilgrims and the indigenous peoples lived in relative peace. At some point, the two peoples came together and shared a meal celebrating the harvest. So goes the story of the first Thanksgiving. But the story is a myth. At best, details were forgotten over the years, at worst, intentionally left out or changed. I also wasn't taught in school much about what happened next. As Europeans continued to arrive, they expanded, taking up more and more land, killing many natives and taking others as slaves. And so just as some see the fourth Thursday in November as symbolizing togetherness and thanksgiving, tied to our country's origin story, others experience it as a reminder of suffering and loss, a national day of mourning, a day to honor land and life that was taken violently without permission. In this week's Torah portion, Yaakov also took something that wasn't his. Taking advantage of his brother Esav when he was tired and hungry, Yaakov bought the birthright, the rights to blessing promised to the firstborn from Esav for the price of one pot of stew. Later, as their father Isaac is growing old, Yaakov says to his father, I am Esav, your firstborn. I have done as you told me, which was preparing his favorite meal. Sit up and eat, that you may give me your innermost blessing. Yaakov and Rivka deceive Isaac by putting uh, Yaakov in Esav's clothing. And when Isaac asks, are you really my son Esav? Vayomer ata ze beni Esav, vayomer ani. Jacob says, yes, I am. The episode ends with Esav finding out Yaakov stole his blessing, sobbing and pleading with his father Isaac to please bless him too. Esav resolves to kill Yaakov and Yaakov flees. All this over the birthright, the fatherly blessing, Isaac's charge to his son. Now, depending on who we were to ask, this could be seen as a beautiful moment of blessing between father and son and cause for celebration, or a memory of deceit, of betrayal. The Parsha ended, as we just read, with the brothers Yaakov and Esav leaving, going different directions in their lives. Nechama Leibowitz asks and answers, thank God, the question, <laughs> what is the attitude of the Torah to Jacob's conduct? She writes that most often the Torah does not uh, offer an opinion outright. Rather, it allows the events and actions of its characters to speak for themselves. When we read on, we see that Yaakov was repaid measure for measure for taking advantage of his father and brother. In coming weeks, and coming parshiot, Yaakov will be deceived by his uncle, forced to work for 20 years. He'll be fooled by Leah and Rachel, who switch places on him, He'll be lied to by his sons when they present Joseph's coat of many colors. This is as blatant a condemnation of Jacob's actions as scripture can give. And what does Torah teach us that we can use in our lives? 
Parshat Vayishlach, again, in a couple of weeks, you'll have to come back and, and hear it, recounts the next meeting between Yaakov and Esav. It says that after praying to God, splitting his family into two camps, and sending Esav many gifts in the form of hundreds of animals, Yaakov went on ahead and bowed low to the ground seven times until he was near his brother. Vayishtachu artsa sheva pe'amim. Praying, sending gifts, splitting up his camp, sending animals. Why did Jacob do so many things before he met Esau? Here the Torah reminds us that we can't know what others need until we ask them. Yaakov, afraid and anxious before meeting his brother, does everything he can possibly think of to appease Esau until he finally ends up right in front of him, throws himself to the ground and goes quiet. Yaakov eventually understands that he cannot show up with pride or even with explanation. He arrives before his brother silently and lowers himself. This teaches us that the way to even begin to make right is to stop and listen, to make room for the voices of the wronged parties. Our instinct might be to speak louder, to make excuses, to explain, to send gifts, perhaps to say, wow, Esau, it looks like you're doing so well for yourself. It's good to see him. But the Torah teaches us to be like Yaakov in this particular moment, to allow Esau to drive the conversation in a way he's comfortable with. Many of the stories of the origins of this country were lost to us. The perspective, perspectives of native peoples forgotten or ignored. But in recent years as a society, we've started asking the question of how to acknowledge these wrongs. Parshat Toldot teaches us that the answer is to listen to allow those who are harmed to lead the conversation, to make room for indigenous voices in our national conversation. We've seen the beginnings of these conversations happening. Cities all over the country are instituting in indigenous people's days. We're renaming or giving back names to lakes, to landmarks, honoring their indigenous heritage. There's a lot of work to do and it may not be possible to undo or to fix years and years of damage done. Andreas Schneider writes that the sacred story of Jacob and Esau show just how difficult reconciliation is. It involves risk, comes with sacrifice, and takes faith and trust in God. Since 1990, I learned this week, well into November, November has been National Native American Heritage Month. The Library of Congress, National Gallery of Art, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration have in-person programs and exhibits, as well as online learning opportunities, uh, interviews, uh, videos, and more on the stories of Native peoples readily available. And so, for whatever is left of this month and moving forward every day, may we, like Yaakov, not ignore our wrongdoings. May we push through the discomfort of showing up in front of people we have wronged, and may we continue to learn from and about the land and people around us. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.